Before we talk about Sisyphus, intense introverts aside, I think that when you're born as a kid, you're always on the outside. You know, your senses invite the world in and the world defines you. There comes a point, and I'm not sure how it happens, there comes a point where something happens to you from the outside and you react. And your reaction is because you internalize something and then you react because of the internalization. There is another aspect of internalizing things. You internalize something and then something about you detaches from certain parts of you and you observe what's taking place inside you. What you experience now becomes very, very pragmatic because now you begin to toy with it. It's like dough. Figure out how much it stretches, what its capacities are, and then out of that comes wisdom. Once you've internalized something, then what happens is the moment you begin to understand it, you become pregnant with this thing called insight, wisdom, understanding. If you happen to be very, very self-sufficient, and none of us are, if you're very self-sufficient, you keep what you've discovered to yourself. You don't need to share it to me with anyone. If on the other hand, you're just like the rest of us in this class, you will either write or you will go out there and talk to people about it. It's very much like Plato's allegory of the cave. First, you're attached to the shadows on the wall. Then you say, could there be more to life than the shadows? Now you begin to internalize. And internalization is a very, very difficult thing because it's filled with loss, it's filled with doubt, it's filled with darkness and confusion and dread and anxiety and frustration because you want to figure things out, but you can't. Uh, you can blame your boyfriend the first maybe 50 times. The 51st time, you kind of say, is there something wrong with me? And then you try to figure things out and it's very, very difficult. Instead of blaming your boyfriend, now you say, maybe I am to be blamed. But well, where do you start? And the moment you start, what are you going to find? And when you do find a few things, how are you going to deal with the things you have found? Are you able to move through them smoothly? Are you going to be suffocated by the emotions brought forth by your discoveries? Will you have enough time to kind of overcome what you have witnessed within yourself and then go out there and express them to your friends? The story of Sisyphus is interesting because you need to know the entire story and how this thing takes place. All of us in this class are like Sisyphus. You live your life, you take classes. There comes a point where King Sisyphus looks around and says, Oh my God, people are getting old. Oh my God, people are getting sick. People are dying. And once you die, you will be forgotten. Most of us are more than happy to just live our lives. We are happy for society to create buttons inside us and then push those buttons and like rats, we just run around and then you die. Hopefully a good death, nothing wrong with that. Sisyphus sees all of this, but he has the capacity to internalize. Am I gonna get old? That's a horrifying place to be. Am I gonna get sick? More importantly, am I going to die? And the answer to all three is yes. But the most devastating question is, will people remember me? How do you remember something if it has a great amount of value and meaning? There's a reason why we talk about Malcolm X, why we talk about Gandhi. And if you really are honest, look at human history for the past 5,000 years. How many people do we talk about? 10, 15 at the most? The rest, they come and they go. And I'm not quite sure how Sisyphus is feeling about all of this. You and I struggle so much in life to make parts of our life valuable and meaningful. And in the end, you realize you look in your bag and there is nothing. And Sisyphus is horrifying. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't want to be forgotten. Once the semester is over, you will not think about me anymore. And I won't think about you. You have not impacted me and I have not impacted you. And that's devastating after 16 weeks. That is life. But Sisyphus doesn't want that. There is another thing you need to understand about this particular story is whatever you thought right and wrong, good and bad, what is valuable, what is not in life are, the moment you internalize your own death and how easily you will be forgotten, none of those things matter anymore. You don't care about the couches and the sofas and the tables and the chairs you've accumulated. You don't even care for the information you've accumulated. They're not going to save you. So you know what Sisyphus does? He begins to read the Bible. He begins to read the Quran. He begins to have a chat with Eckhart Toilet and Sad Guru and all the teachers out there who claim to possess some nuggets of wisdom. So he goes to where Zeus is. You know why? Zeus is God. Zeus never dies. Zeus is immortal. Zeus has power. And Sisyphus lusts after it. Sisyphus does not want to be forgotten. And you know how you'll be forgotten? Death. That's the ultimate. 
and he tries to steal the wisdom of immortality from the gods. Zeus comes back because he was down here on earth having a good time with simile, immortal women, and Hera, his wife isn't home. Zeus comes back and all of a sudden catches Sisyphus. What are you doing here? I don't want to die. Please, I don't want to be forgotten. Really, is that what you want? Zeus asks, yes. Okay, go home, I'll make you immortal. And you'll have a task, one single task you will do for eternality. Every morning you're gonna wake up, you're gonna uh, make yourself Noah's bagel with some cream cheese, some coffee. Then you're gonna put your shoes on. Then you're gonna go to the front door, open it, go outside. And then there's this huge boulder sitting for you, waiting for you. It's a rock, looks like a ball. And you have to push it up this hill. And your only task is push it and just throw it over the hill. Sisyphus is happy because he will never die, which means he has power to always influence the people around him. Now, you have to be careful what you desire for because it can come back to bite you. Every morning, Sisyphus wakes up. After making himself some food, he goes outside and pushes this rock up the hill. It's near the edge, but Sisyphus gets really, really, really tired. He can't take a step forward anymore, and the rock feels very, very heavy now. He steps to the side and watches this boulder, this rock, roll back down. He goes down and tries again, goes down and tries again. And this is what he does for the rest of his life. At a certain point, Sisyphus, he wakes up and he says, I know exactly how this is going to happen. I know the story of my life. It's like I have dialed 1-900 psychic. I am the psychic. I know my own future. And my own future is the following. I find things that are attractive out there. Lust is born inside me. Desire is created inside me. Desire multiplied by lust. Greed comes inside me. And you don't become greedy for things that are unpleasant. And you don't lust for things that are unpleasant. And you don't desire for things that are unpleasant. So behind every curtain of lust, there is a positive feeling. And behind every greed, there is a lust that gave you a good amount of pleasure. It's not God who brought you a girlfriend, attraction. And then out of greed, you have a want. It's still intellectual. If it's there, fine. If it's not, that's okay. You spend some more time, you create history. History creates identity and value. Now it turns into need. If you're lucky and you have the resources, now remember, just because you have need for something, it doesn't mean you're going to have it. You need resources. And resources mean savings. It needs patience. It needs cleverness and cunningness. You need resources. Then you obtain. Now you have it. And what happens when you have it? You begin to get consumed by the world of the need, whatever that you found yourself attracted to. There comes a point where your obsession for the object of attraction lessens. So as the intensity of your need diminishes, you become less interested. And when you are less interested, there are hints of dissatisfaction. And once you're dissatisfied, now you have hints of frustration. This leads into doubt. Why did I pursue this in the first place? And then eventually what happens, long story short, you become indifferent. Whatever feelings, emotions you had here, its presence or absence, it no longer matters to you. This is our life. If this is a little too abstract, when you were born, you had this need to be nursed by your mom. Then you cried and you screamed. And eventually she nursed you and you, you know, shut your mouth. At the age of three, you screamed and shouted for a bike. Eventually, your poor father saved some money and bought you a bike. And now it's just collecting dust and getting rusty. Then you want a girlfriend. After a while, that got bored. Then you want to go to school and you got some degrees. That got bored. You read a few books. That got boring. And that is the foundation of human life. You're moved by desire. If you're unfortunate, you will attain what you desired. If you're very unfortunate, you will suck the life out of what you have now obtained. And now it becomes lifeless sitting in your life and you will do whatever you can to get rid of it. That is the story of Sisyphus. He knows exactly what's going to happen. If you know how everything is going to be, your desire to live longer, that desire begins to become less interesting, less desirable. You will in fact pray for death, a quick, healthy death, because you know the outcome of everything. 
the moment something is born, you see its coffin sitting right, right next to it. It's a devastating philosophy of life. Well, we are told that Sisyphus is happy, but he has no choice but to be happy, because what can you do? And the only way you can be happy is by not paying attention. As long as you don't pay attention, you're happy. If Sisyphus has become aware, and if the awareness is something that is somewhat tragic, you understand things really, really well, but there isn't much you can do about it. To remedy it, it begins to become very, very burdensome. And I suppose the next question would be, is it good to become aware? And then the question becomes, what should we expose people to? Do I really want to make you aware of some things for which you're not ready? Why should you be exposed to such a philosophy? Especially if you don't know how to process the web. And all of a sudden you realize you become aware, but that awareness paralyzes you. And then you get depressed. And that's the, probably the function of all kinds of awareness. It doesn't really matter. Awareness have a tendency of making you profoundly passive sometimes sad, sorrowful, and depressed.